Would it be folly to establish a strictly legitimate and strictly limited federal state? Would it really be folly to restore the style of justice that existed before the establishment of the Supreme Court? It is possible that a loose confederacy of variously governed states may actually be the very best match in the 21st century with our instantaneous global communications and our extensive and productive communities enhanced and supplemented by extensive and rich virtual networks. Even as libertarians and others rightfully rue the Leviathan, we live in a world where, in real terms, we are today better equipped and more capable of decentralized self-government than at any previous time in human history. Today in the United States, unlimited information is instantly available to old and young, to the formally educated and the illiterate, to the fact finder and the politician, the entrepreneur, the scientist, the worker, and the business mogul. This wonderful 21st century may be exactly what the anti-federalists envisioned. I am often reminded of the famous quote from the 1992 movie remake of The Last of the Mohegans. A loyalist commander asks, and who empowered these colonials to pass judgment on England's policies and to come and go without so much as a by your leave? Coral Monroe answers, they do not live their lives by your leave. They hack it out of the wilderness with their own two hands, bearing their children along the way. Mostly due to modern technologies, we have today outstanding decentralization, mobility, unleashed human creativity, and if we need it, anonymity. We have the wilderness. We have or can get what we need to live our lives and control our destinies. We can hack out our own lives. We may be taught to live our lives at the direction and by the permission of government, but in fact, we don't have to. The business world has streamlined. Businesses have energetically embraced continuous learning, instant information, and constant competition. They have decentralized as they have focused simultaneously on both the individual worker and individual customer. But our government presumes no competition, ignores or denies the availability of instant and rich information and the truth behind it. Our government resists continuous learning and resents such learning by its subjects. The American government, for all its reinvention and customer service mantras, remains antiquated, slow, third rate in everything it does. This is true even where it spends most of its time and resources. Iraq and Afghanistan stand as bloody testaments to this abject mediocrity. In contrast to the world of business and invention, the U.S. government is becoming more intensely stupid, more remarkably incompetent, and more of a problem for all who suffer it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So then, is it possible to restore the republic, to go back to a former model, or perhaps to create a new model of an American republic? Yes, it is. Governments are made of people, and people ultimately shape or abandon their governments. I don't know what form a restored republic would take. How small could Washington, D.C. get, and what would it take to shrink it down? When the small government republicans to whom Reagan gave voice and imagination, although little else, when they got to Congress, they found that instead of shrinking government, all they could do was make it even more massive. We now recognize that that's all they truly wanted to do. Bob Higgs has written extensively on the process by which this occurs. The nature of the state is to grow, to cultivate events and activities that ensure its continued growth, and to grow even more, even as it strangles and starves its erstwhile host. And yet, as Lou Rockwell has written most eloquently, the miracle of freedom is that even as our own government has grown beyond all expectations, the level of free enterprise and productivity, the inventiveness and exuberance of mankind has outpaced that government growth by leaps and bounds. Thus, I believe America was once a republic, can be again, albeit in various forms. How might we get there? First of all, I don't exactly know. But here are several ways to consider. One way would be to do as the Federalists did 230 years ago. They believed that the Confederation had failed. They convened, ostensibly, to restore the Confederation and make it better. Then, by dark of night, these leaders threw away the articles and started fresh with a new document, a more executive presidency, 
a different Congress and the Supreme Court. Absent the mild restraint offered by the first 10 amendments, these leaders had created a nascent European kingdom, complete with an adoring court and agreeable jesters. I think it is clearer and clearer each decade and each day that the Constitution has failed to give us a republic. Or as Ben Franklin suggested, maybe it did, but we failed to keep it. Certainly, the Constitution as a document has failed to deliver government that embodies civic duty, virtue, social cohesion, and where there is a high devotion, fidelity, and regard for rule of law. The idea of an organized revolutionary change formulated through meetings of wealthy, powerful men, a new constitutional convention, perhaps, may at first glance seem somewhat absurd. Yet, when you think about it, this is exactly how our government operates every day of the week in every administration. We speak of a neoconservative hijack. We bemoan the long-term directions of our national and international policies put forth by the so-called establishment. In fact, from the beginning, the making of national policy has been done and is always done through secretive conventions of wealthy, elitist, and well-placed men. This is also how our nation decides to go to war, as George Tenet's new memoirs and his recent interviews confirm. A decision to invade and occupy Iraq was made in secret and unaccountably by powerful people who are themselves unaccountable to either government agencies, the law, the facts, or the people of the United States. And as George W. Bush himself noted a few years ago, and I quote, maybe somebody needs to explain to me why they say something, but I don't feel like I owe anybody an explanation. Miraculously, George captured the failure of the Republic in one easy to understand sentence. Could a new kind of constitutional convention for a new republic be organized by freedom lovers or classical liberals or libertarians? Just as the Federalists locked the doors and changed the agenda, so might we. Ought to have the power to do just that and to save the world. But we don't have that power, nor should we want it. As Lord Acton observed, that kind of centralized power is never what it seems. Another way to restore the republic is more painful and more cruel and not just to government bureaucrats and the subsidy-dependent population. This way requires nothing more of us than to simply stand aside and watch as the American experiment collapses, to do nothing as republic turns to democracy and then to tyranny. If we survive that last horrific phase with sanity and health intact, we can promote ideas and republican forms of self-government for whatever remains. We could find ourselves in a new Athens, meeting with our neighbors to decide everything. Or we could find ourselves on a new Crete, obeying natural law and honoring moderation in all things. Or perhaps in a militaristic oligarchy called New Sparta. Or we could find ourselves slaves and helots without a hope in the world. A front page headline a few weeks ago read, Americans feeling low, burdened by an inability to live as we desire, to produce, and to benefit from that production as we want, and beaten down by taxes, regulation, and inflation, many Americans already feel like slaves and helot, helots in a tyranny beyond their control. But I think we are not helots and slaves, not yet. And that American government that seems so overwhelming and tyrannical, so powerful, is actually as weak here at home as it is in Iraq and Afghanistan. There is another way we can restore the republic, we don't have to wait. We don't have to organize or enter into armed revolution. We don't even have to formally design a plan of attack. It won't be easy, but on the other hand, it won't be that difficult. We are doing it now. I want to share something that jumped out at me again from a recent newspaper article. An 86-year-old Belgian schoolteacher was recognized by Israel for saving 300 children from the Nazis. In 1942, Andrei Herskovici witnessed a Gestapo raid on, the, on her school. She then joined an underground rescue organization, and for more than two years, she quietly worked with other like-minded people to save these Jewish children from an evil state that would have seen their lives destroyed. During the ceremony, she said, and I quote, what I did was merely my duty. Disobeying the laws of the time was just the normal thing to do, unquote. 